3 p.m. on May the 7th. Are the microphones picking up what the microphones need to pick up? No. Not nope. yet. <coughs> Any, uh, can we get the microphones working? This better? Yeah. Okay, good. So the meeting of the task force on higher education on incentive funding will come to order. It is now 1.04 p.m. May the 7th. Uh, our board is in front of us, and we have several items to review. If possible, I would like us to focus today principally on uh, our thoughts about the distribution of the fiscal year 2009 uh, funding. Obviously, what we decide about that might steer us in a direction for future recommendations as well, but not necessarily. Uh, clearly, what we recommend for the future is going to be, to say the least, massaged considerably by lawmakers. Uh, what we recommend for the distribution of the $100 million for fiscal year 2009 will also be merely a recommendation, and the Legislative Budget Board will make the final decision. But on that, we're recommending action on items already in statute. For the second part, we're recommending for consideration things that may or may not go into statute. And I think we have much more latitude and room for a variety of proposals which the legislature will no doubt want to debate and consider and modify and rerun calculations on. So today, let's, uh, if it's all right, focus on the fiscal year 2009 issues, but always mindful that at the same time, many of the same principles are relevant for going forward as well. I don't know when we'll be ready to make a final re recommendation on either of those two parts, but uh, we'll see how far we get today. I would certainly hope that at least on the fiscal year 2009 part, we can make a final recommendation at our next meeting uh, and still give ourselves time to consider still further the uh, going forward part that will inevitably be more various because it will include the health institutions and include a variety of other things that we perhaps don't have data on now and that really will be incentives to change future behavior. Is that all right? If so, uh, as uh, laid out uh, on the agenda item, first we're going to review some uh, input that has been provided by various of the members. Uh, and. Uh, there are, in addition, some uh, items that we will add uh, following Mr. Francis's item in which we've had some additional input from other members of the committee. Uh, the first item listed is a copy of the memo that I sent following our last meeting, uh, which was uh, a reaction to a proposal that had come forth from the coordinating board committee uh, in which uh, one of the uh, directions that was being recommended was to potentially weight the funding supplements, the incentive fundings exclusively on at-risk and uh, STEM and underserved areas. Uh, and with the new figures that were uh, provided uh, during the course of that meeting or just before, uh, I had calculated the percent changes as, as, a, as a comparison to the base funding. And then at the very ending of that meeting, we got some additional calculations along that line. And just to summarize uh, my thoughts about that, uh, they're really uh, more on the second page. And I, I would just say, uh, from my perspective, that we it seems to me, especially for fiscal year 2009, we're, we're honing in on four items to consider and how to weight them. 
One is the total number of degrees. Second is the annual increase in degrees. We might discuss whether that's a one-year increase or an average of a two-year increase. That's a detail, I think. Third, uh, what extra bonus uh, there should be weighted for uh, critical fields and at-risk students total. Uh, and then fourth, uh, the uh, increase in uh, those, those numbers. And finally, uh, the runs that have been done thus far have been uh, exclusively on bachelor's degrees for community colleges. There are counterparts. But specifically, graduate degrees were excluded from the general academic calculations. Uh, I, I would like to bring back into the discussion whether that exclusion is wise or not. A as an example, we have heard, uh, and I heard again on Monday, some of you were there on Monday in Dallas when uh, Representative Branch's interim committee on higher education uh, funding uh, uh, took testimony from a variety of institutions. Uh, and uh, one of the recurring themes there, since part of the focus was on health institutions, uh, but also on health professions, nursing schools in particular, and allied health school, was that we need more nurses. We would all agree with that. And there are incentives to do that. And what we have heard over and over again is that we are unable to admit all the qualified students who want to become nurses because there is a dearth of faculty members in nursing schools who need graduate degrees to become faculty members. So if we want to incentivize more nurses to graduate, and we don't count toward that incentive graduate degrees in nursing, as one example, it seems to me we're not enabling the institutions to do what we're trying to incentivize them to do, so that uh, producing a master's degree nurse or a doctoral degree nurse seems to me to be important as well as producing a bachelor's degree nurse because Without the graduate nurses, we won't be able to train as many bachelor's degree nurses as we have applicants, qualified applicants. So I would throw that out as something we might want to re-examine. Similarly, uh, I was in discussions with some people at Texas Instruments uh, a few weeks ago. Texas Instruments has laid people off and hired and laid people off and hired in a variety of cycles over the past two years. Uh, more urgent need is for master's degree engineers than for bachelor's degree engineers. And if we incentivize the, ins the institutions only to provide bachelor's degree engineers, we're not really serving the people who are hiring and retaining uh, the workforce that they need. So uh, I would just uh, ask that we consider before a final decision is made whether we want to exclude graduate degrees from the uh, incentivization, even for fiscal year 2009, and certainly for going forward. Uh, if anybody wants to comment on that, we can stop now or we can go through all the other comments that have been made by various uh, panel members and then come back and discuss them as a group. And I would, Karen, I would agree with you for all the reasons you just said that, my, that we should include uh, graduate in, in the waiting process. My question would be it's how to wait them because you get a, a bachelor process, let's call it 120. Uh, semester credit hours over a four-year period of time, and then you have a master's degree, which could be as few as 30 to 36, up to maybe 60 hours over a shorter period of time. And so how do you weight that in the process? So my own thought before what you said is, you know, maybe it's a half a weighting, and someone could argue lower teacher uh, to student pupil ratio and higher expenses should, should weight in another direction, but and maybe the coordinating board might have some opinions. But if we're going to include them, which I think we should, I would still raise the question on, on, on how they should be weighted. Ray, do you have a comment to that? Well, I, my, my, my first inclination is to say that it should be weighted equally. Um, I, I think we, we would want to guard against uh, mission creep and uh, creating, uh, creating unintended uh, incentives for institutions to expand uh, certain programs before they're prepared to do so. Um, since we have since we have shortages in certain areas like nursing across the board, I'm not sure that that um, 
uh, that it's a compelling argument that one type of nurse is more valuable than another. Uh, but that's that, that's we probably have to look at some numbers. There there are a lot of institutions, of course, that don't have graduate programs in, in nursing, and uh, I wouldn't want uh, to, as I say, create an incentive, an unintended in incentive to expand programs, particularly among institutions that aren't ready to do that. We've already seen that in other fields. Which could lead you to, to wait them I mean, less than an than a undergraduate degree, then, if you don't want to create the incentive. In other words, if it's a... Well, on the other hand, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be uh, caught in the position of making the argument that a, that a graduate-trained nurse is less valuable than one trained at a community college or at the, at the BS level. But it, to me, that, and I won't say any more, we've got a, a duplication potential here as we work toward a comprehensive recommendation in an associate degree. So if someone goes to community college, that school earns a bonus for those two years under an incentive proposal, transfers to, the, to a, a, a bachelor granting institution. It receives a bonus for that, stu that same student, goes on and either there or either there or somewhere else and receives a graduate degree. So now you've had the same student incentivized three times. And I'm not saying that's bad. That's why, I mean, I think that's good. But it raises the question on what is the waiting you know, process there. Yeah. Yeah. And is the bachelor's degree equal to the associate degree or versus the graduate degree? And they take the different levels of time and, 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 te and, and teacher concentration. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would just make one observation and not particularly to advocate it, uh, but going back now 15 years, 16 years, to the recommendations of the Health Advisory Committee in 1992, the waiting for the various allied health degrees or nursing degrees, for example, was taken up. And the recommendation there, uh, this was only for health institutions, it's a little more complex than general academic institutions, was that some allied health degrees required roughly 30 semester hours to get that final certification or degree. Some required 60. Uh, that's for a bachelor's degree. For a master's degree, some required an additional 30. Some required an additional 60. For a doctoral degree, and there are a few allied health doctoral degrees, such as physical therapy, they might require 90 or 120. And uh, it, the recommendation within allied health, and I would presume the recommendation within nursing as well, would have been to weight it according to the semester hours required to get that degree. Right. So in the case of a engineering degree, if it's 120 hours for a bachelor's degree and an additional 60 hours or 48, whatever it would be for a master's degree, you might weight the master's degree half as much. If it's an additional 120 hours for a PhD in engineering, you might wait that equally or something like that. Now, the costs are greater, as you mentioned, at the graduate level because the faculty-student ratio is greater. But when you start getting into that arena, then you introduce the complexity that we've told ourselves we want to avoid. The formula funding has, has because it's focused on courses, is able to and, and, deal and, with and, the complexity. And that, and that deals with that as well already. That's great. And just one other comment, and, and I know we're obviously not here to talk about formula funding, but it kind of goes back to one of your comments, Woody, and that is in, in the recommendations that we're making to uh, the governor and the LBB, it does have performance funding, which has never been in the formula funding. There's $100 million recommended for community colleges. There's $178 million recommended for general academics. And that is a all degree, no waiting for at risk critical fields. And so I think it begs the same question you brought up is that if that were to be adopted by the legislature, then the question is do we want to incent that and that pool? Plus, if you're looking at our, I think the short term recommendation is a different, a different case, Kern, but on the long term recommendation, do we want to be incenting that same? Degree, those same degrees over in this pool. Right. And um, and I know that's subject to the legislature, yet at the same time I think we can think about um, in our recommendation if, if we don't want to you know, do it in both sides of the deal, we could basically say it's that we would pick it up over here if it's not approved in the formula funding recommendation. Otherwise, if it is, you drop it out of this side. And that, and that, in fact, was exactly what I was going to suggest, that because I'm very supportive of what 
coordinating board recommended as part of the base funding, but if it isn't in the base funding, it seems to me it would be a good thing to be in the incentive fund. Any other comments about this before we move on to uh, Jeff Sanderford's uh, memo, which I think we have yesterday? Just one other comment that to get back to your first one was to try to separate 09 from the future going forward. My only concern there is, is, is clearly 09, we can't do anything that's really upsetting. Right. And, and so there's a good argument to do something totally different than what we might recommend long term. My only concern is, is if we in fact, come up with something short term, um, which and we've got options here that we that are uh, that are different than what we ultimately do long term. Are we sending the wrong message there? And there's some things that are obviously not on the table that you, we won't have a problem differentiating when we make our long term health, for example, is it in or is it out? That's not maybe a short term issue, but we could come up with a formula that we agree on because we know we're not incentivizing; we're essentially determining. Or valuing past behavior, right. uh, so it would be logical to reach a conclusion there. We're going to deal with that differently than we are long term. But I have a little concern that we're adopting something that we don't think is that it, it differs from what we ultimately recommend in the long term. That we send some mixed signals there. So I just right. want to make that. What, were, what were we asked to do? Well, I, I think we have to get back. I mean, what what did the legislature ask us to do? Oh, we have two charges. They are related but different. As I understand it, both of them relate to providing funds based on outcomes. One is our recommendation for how $100 million should be distributed for fiscal year 2009 based on some formula related to general academics but potentially in addition to community colleges based on outcomes. Secondly, to recommend things that the legislature might consider for going forward. Uh, again, to incentivize desired outcomes. And as Woody points out, as we've all told one another, it's a little late to incentivize outcomes, but we can uh, provide a reward for desired performance or outcomes. Uh, and I agree with Mr. Hunt, those shouldn't be perceived to be totally opposite. The things that we want to reward ought to also be similar to what we are wanting to incentivize for the future, mm -hmm. but not necessarily identical because of the nature of some things we might want to incentivize may take a long-term investment, and we couldn't possibly reward that today. Okay. 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 Uh, we received a... Uh, a memo from Jeff Sandifer, and Jeff, can I ask you to please uh, summarize that for us? It's in your packet. It's dated April 30th, and it starts, Dear Task Force Members. Yes, sir. Um, my letter was not really addressing how do we divide the money between schools, so how much should Texas A&M get versus UT versus even the community colleges, but more a suggestion that after we've done that, uh, that we... Um, instruct, request that the schools take a portion of that money and pass it down to the classroom in the form of bonuses for teachers. And, and the, reason, um, uh, the reason I'm suggesting this is if you think about how do we really graduate more students, the easiest way is to have your most productive and best teachers teach a few more. I mean, that, I mean, that really, if you think about what's the end, I mean, how do you ever get more, te more students through? Other than recruiting more students, the administration doesn't have uh, a lot of levers to pull. If you can actually pay teachers for teaching well and for teaching more, you can quickly have an impact on creating more seats and more classes. And so what I'm suggesting is we take a portion of the funding. If we, if UT gets $5 million of this money, we say some percentage, and here I picked 40%, but I'm just picking a number. 40% of that $5 million or $2 million would be instructed for the school, for the university to spend somehow in a teacher reward system based on student satisfaction and number of students taught. Uh, this is similar to the program I testified about for the University of Oklahoma. So that's, that's a summary and, and my suggestion is just that that's, if we want to really incentivize change, it's in the classroom that you can get the most, most bang for the buck. Okay. Comments? 
I mean, I guess my reaction was I went through this and I was not at the meeting where you, you unfortunately, where you made your, your presentation. But I agree with everything uh, that's laid out here is you know, a step in the right direction. My real question, Jeff, is do we want to do a top down mandate essentially as opposed to empowering the CEOs of our 35 institutions to? decide to what degree they, they might want to spend more than 40 percent to do this sure. or they might want to I mean let them give them some the maximum flexibility as long as we have a program that's predict that's long term that's predictable uh, that they can rely on then uh, they begin to develop the tools in some places that might be a little different tool or a little different right. percentage and so that's really my only comment is it, at what level of, of mandate, and, and I think Bernie had one on textbooks, so I'd have the same comment on, <coughs> do, do, do we want to mandate that at this, at this level? I, I, my suggestion is that you've got a lot of flexibility as of how much, or is there, is, there a, is there a minimum amount you could spend more, certainly, uh, as long as it's based on student recommendation, student satisfaction. Because if you're going to base it on faculty committee of faculties judging how well they teach, you might as well not have it. I mean, you know, so as long as it's based on a fair representation of student satisfaction and done on a per student basis, and the reason I say that is that incrementally incentivizes you to teach one more student, which is where you get the bang for the buck. I'm very open to how the schools were administered. I think there's lots of flexibility in lots of different ways. It would not suggest that we define it too, too far beyond that. And I didn't go into a lot of detail because if, we're, if we'll consider this, we can draft something simple and concrete and with giving lots of flexibility. If not, there's no need to do that. So. Jeff, uh, the, the, the beauty contest effect, I mean, how do you manage that? The, um, two answers to that. One, and I've read probably 20 studies on this, and there, this is a religious question, not a fact-based question, because there are some people that believe that there's an enormous beauty contest effect, and they have studies to show that, and some believe that there's none. My own opinion, having read a lot of it, is it appears it's about a 20% effect on the ratings. There's a very easy way to get rid of that, and that is you only provide the voluntary bonus to people who agree to, to uh, behave within certain grade curves. In other words, if you give more than 50% A's, that's no problem. You're welcome. You're faculty. You can do that. You just won't qualify for this incentive program. Uh, that's a way to take the, the beauty contest out of it. Uh, kind of a, a tip of the hat to Woody saying, let's not let's not get too prescriptive. I didn't put something like that in, but you can easily. Mm -hmm. Frankly, it's almost a trap for the faculty that complains about that. You say, fine, we'll put in grade inflation curves. Like, whoa, wait a minute. We didn't really want that. <laughs> but but it turns out to be a fairly minor impact on the on the student satisfaction ratings. Okay. Yes. Well, the, 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 the problem with that approach is, for example, what if you're a professor in the Plan 2 program at UT Austin where all the students are enormously capable and you teach a seminar with uh, 12 students and every one of them legitimately earns an A. I've taught in courses like that where all the students are extremely bright. And you're, you're imposing a, a curve uh, to take care of a larger issue. And I agree that great inflation would be, a, would be a problem. But in circumstances like that, it wouldn't work. Another issue is that, that there's no uniform method for calculating uh, teaching effectiveness that's used around Texas. Every institution uses a different instrument. Some are, are more rigorous than others. Uh, some, are, some instruments are a little more than popularity contests. Uh, the last point is there's already an incentive in higher education to improve teaching if we were to use it. Every faculty code of, of uh, performance that I know of uh, says that faculty are, are to be evaluated on the basis of research, teaching, and service. If we paid more attention to the teaching component, then faculty uh, raises would be uh, based to some extent on the effectiveness of teaching. So we, we already have that component if we paid attention to it. And then finally, uh, th this, this runs directly contrary to one of our goals in Texas, and that is uh, improve, uh, uh, the, or improve the quality of our research universities and, uh, and increase the number of our research universities. Well, but my understanding was our charge here is to talk about incentives to graduate more students, better trained. So, so I mean, I think that takes the research issue off the table. The, my great inflection comment was only really a reaction to Bernie's concern about a beauty contest. But I would hold that the absolute and only measure of teaching effectiveness is whether the student learns or not. 
And that given that we do not have faculty observing very often, at least in the schools I've been involved in, the very best indication you had of that have of that is do the students think they have learned? And as my experience has been, if you're clear about what you expect them to learn or what they should expect to learn, you get very good feedback on whether they've learned something or not. But I would hold it may not be the best solution, it's the only solution given that we don't have anybody else in the classroom except for the teacher and the students. Uh, Jeff, it, with this recommendation, yes, my expectation is that for fiscal year 09, the great majority of institutions don't have this sort of system in place and would be scrambling and probably wouldn't do it very well. Right. So is this more a recommendation for the going forward part than for the fiscal year 2009? I, I, I mean, that certainly makes sense. And, and, and my sense is the, le the best we're going to do is put some recommendations in. Right. And the legislature is going to do what they want to do. And they might, and and they might on a different want, want to do I, a I, mandate or not. Yeah, I will say Woody was with us at the uh, Governor's Business Council meeting, and the governor gave a speech on this topic at lunch where this was directly mentioned. So I think this is going to be at least on his agenda and something he might want to have is a you know it's just a nod to the head of it so he can work with the legislature. So I, I'm going to suggest then if it's all right that that we leave this on the table and focus again when we're talking about going forward as something that might be recommended to the legislature. The legislature sometimes likes to mandate methodologies and sometimes doesn't. It varies from year to year. My only concern about it with regard to this committee is that we're charged with making recommendations with regard to outcomes. I agree with you that an effective program, as you've described, ought to attract the best students, teach them well, and get them graduated, and result in the desired outcome. But it is not an outcome in, in and of itself. And if it really works, as we, you and I think it would work, it would result. And as Woody said, it is one of the methods that might be used, and whether it should be 40 percent, 60 percent, 20 percent. But uh, I do think it ought to stay on the table as something that higher education considers, and uh, the legislature, obviously, uh, with input from us, can be encouraged or not, as the case may be, to consider it. I, I, I do want to say, in, in response to to this issue, that. Uh, we at the Court Aging Board recognize that learning outcomes and, and uh, the effectiveness of teaching is a critical issue in higher education. We are in the process now of, of uh, working with, uh, we're working right now with the three large systems. We're working with UT, a and and the Texas State System to take a look at ways we can effectively measure learning outcomes. And you're right, the Governor's Office is very interested in this and we're working hard on it. So I, I wanted to assure you that in raising um, concerns about uh, what you're proposing. I'm not at all sure. underestimating the importance of, 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 of looking at teacher effectiveness. Sure. Yes. Kurt, I think you're absolutely right in what, what he said. Yeah, the problem we've all struggled with is the first hundred million dollars, it's not incentive, it's a bonus. It's a bonus. We're trying to figure out you know, what we use as our criteria to recommend that. Uh, and so, uh, we probably need to focus there and then take these ideas on a, on a go-forward basis. Of course, just one last point. This really is a bonus. If you look at it, what this is is a yeah. bonus for yeah. good teaching. So if if our first year is a bonus, this is a bonus. I mean, it's it's now your problem is the system's okay. not in place yet. Yeah, but we, don't, we, we can't measure it yet. Right. Yeah. Uh, moving on, we have a also dated uh, April 30th from Woody Hunt. Woody, would you like to run us through that? Kern, my approach um, here was certainly more focused um, toward the long-range, uh, long-term recommendations and trying to get a, a plan in place that uh, incentivizes uh, behavior that toward the state goals uh, on more graduates, particularly in the at-risk and in, in, in critical fields. Um, as it relates to 09, it would, I'd refer back to my earlier comment, my concerns of essentially paying the bonus and essentially vesting uh, institutions in the bonus based on one method and then we have a long-term recommendation that um, um, tries to move in a different direction and that creates some, some maybe some unnecessary tension but uh, the, the things that I tried to highlight here is not to incentivize the mission creep uh, 
to consider other incentive uh, funds like the Competitive Knowledge Fund that incentivizes research and our, uh, and our four largest research institutions. Um, uh, the comment of not trying to incentivize uh, Austin and A&M to increase their freshman class. I think that needs to be taken into consideration, but once again, that maybe is not necessarily, wouldn't be an issue when you're looking at, uh, at 09. Um, once again, I focus mine on what I thought was the simplest approach uh, and is consistent with what the state wants. It's more graduates. Um, and I will you know, prepare to make that argument when we're ready to talk about uh, the long term. I'm certainly more flexible uh, on, as you look at, at 09, on how we get to that, um, um, uh, uh, to, to how we determine to pay that bonus. But once again, the concern being moving from one method to the other might prove to be more difficult, and I don't want to settle for a suboptimum long term. Uh, 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 program. But I'd be glad to ask any, uh, any questions. I did ask, also add, the, uh, which was in the coordinating board's proposal at one time to set aside some of the funds, I believe 20 percent for innovation. And as we talked the last meeting, you changed your opinion there. I still think capacity building and uh, at an institutional level and also at a regional level, uh, it certainly bears merit. and. That might be something that 09 uh, of funds could be could be utilized for. Could you elaborate on that last point about a, how if we recommended say 20 million dollars or pick a number for building the system to, uh, to do this? How would uh, how would it be determined how that 20 million? would be distributed out. Yeah, I think there, there are several approaches. One that I'd recommend it was simply looking at and going to a formula which would be tied to graduation rates, the lower your graduation rate in relationship to your size or your, your student body, maybe the more money you get because obviously you need to, 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 to build capacity more. Another approach though, which maybe goes back to the way the coordinating board was planning on doing it, uh, was to take competitive proposals from institutions. I think you could also take competitive proposals from the current regions of the state, the coordinated designated regions, um, and you might even allow in that uh, the concept of having regions combined together because I think there's some natural alignments. You know, I'm still firmly convinced that we've got a very diverse state with different economic development and workforce issues by region and that we need to engage uh, for uh, our for our business sector and our civic sector with our higher education sector to under, to better push and make uh, forward our economic uh, development, our workforce objectives. That needs to be much better coordinated as today from an international and national and international competitive issue. It, not much different than what the Emerging Technology Fund has done and their approach. They've got, I think, seven regions around the state uh, that take competitive proposals and allocate dollars to try to, to transfer technology and create new uh, technology through venture capital investments. So I see the, the uh, being able to use some of these dollars, if we want to do it competitively, I think that's fine as far as opposed to now let institutions say what they can do. Maybe we'll get some good ideas that would be transferable and let regions say what they could do. And I, I think that would help put in place both at the institution and at a region a more coordinated uh, approach going forward that is more decentralized than what we have today. So if you're at a coordinating board, you've essentially created, uh, like let's say the transportation area where they've created these regional mobility authorities, so you've delegated some, uh, maybe some responsibility and maybe a little authority to a regional basis, maybe you can do the same thing in, in higher education. Because I think the diversity is so great, we need to, we, we would um, benefit from, from getting that type of input and I and think ultimately financial resources as well. With regard to competitive proposals and whether the coordinating board did it themselves or formed regional delegate, delegated uh, commissions, if you will, to do it, is that more a recommendation for going forward or for distributing fiscal year 09? And, and but because, I, I would just but because of 09, current, I guess, because it was a bonus, I saw the 09 funds maybe particularly being those that could be used it that way to begin to set the capacity, establish the capacity uh, that would put institutions and regions in place to utilize the incentive funding going, hopefully going, the 178 million that you're recommending going, going forward, if, assuming that that's approved by the legislature. Having been involved with the Emerging Technology <laughs> Fund, not as a decider, but as a very interested applicant, mm -hmm. uh, and realizing that uh, the regional uh, 
panels were actually very important in that regard. Uh, I would note that it was after that was established, it was the end of the fiscal year before everything was in place to begin making funding decisions. And so I'm a little worried personally that if we made that recommendation for fiscal year 09, the coordinating board has a lot of things to do for fiscal year 09 and deciding how to delegate, either to make those decisions itself or how to set up panels and delegate and have those decisions made. Uh, we may not know how that fraction of the hundred million was going to be distributed until the very end of the fiscal year when a lot of other things are busy. Kern, that's actually one of the reasons that we kind of pulled back on that in the late fall because we pretty well came to that conclusion. We just didn't think uh, that we could develop a system and get it out uh, in time. You know, Woody, part of our thought originally was to use some of that incentive money as seed money, if you will. You know, look at those good proposals out there. Can we help you, you know, get, get jump started? Uh, you know, that's just some of the ideas that we had, had kicked around for a while. But here again, at the end of the day, we came to the conclusion we just didn't think we could get it out in the old ad. And, and, and Bob, I, what I saw in this opportunity is because I think we're short seed money, some of the high return dollars that can be spent are seed money either at the institutional level or on, a re on this regional concept because those dollars just aren't there. Everybody's got their appropriated dollars and they're all tight on how they, they spend them. But sure. it, the margin, if they're incentivized, I think there's some potentially high return rewards there. And so that my, was my reaction when I saw that you were even at least at one point contemplating it, it moving at least on the on the institutional level, not necessarily on the regional, but I think the I'm, I'm totally convinced that the long-term regionalization is, is going to be more and more of a dominant theme just because of the need to be flexible, because we all have different sets of, compu of, of competitors in the different regions of the state. We're going to have to be more flexible. Higher education has got to relate to the workforce of the region that they're in. Most of our students that go to higher education go to higher education in the regions they live, and that's going to be increasingly, I think, true. So, uh, you know, to put all those pieces together, that's what I saw as an opportunity if, if there's enough flexibility there. But there also has to be managed, and you've got to have the, the staff and the time, and you've got priorities. And I'm no, and I think you're that. exactly right. Uh, and, and, you know, you always have to put a name and a face on something. When we had that discussion, we always talked about Lorena, for instance, just because it was real easy to reach out. You know, can you take a certain amount of money and have a big impact in that region? might not make near as much difference in Dallas or Houston or Austin, but it, but it could in there. I, I think it's an idea worth trying to continue to explore. In one sense, the fact that the recommendations for the distribution of the incentive funding are going to be coming to institutions late. In fact, too late for them to work it into their budgets for fiscal year 09 might encourage them to use it to start up new sorts of initiatives rather than just say, isn't this nice, now we can uh, have a budget that's uh, $64 million a year instead of $61 million a year. Instead, here's $3 million. We've already got our $61 million budget. What are we going to do this one time with this $3 million windfall? And Good. let's invest it in planning for what's coming down the pipe. Which the, however it's allocated, maybe the result will be the same because it's not going to be going for a particular course taught or something. Any other comments about what he's intriguing suggestion? Kern, though, at that, just say it, I'm, I think we've said it, but we did not take it off the table because we didn't believe that it made sense. We really thought it made sense. We just didn't think we could execute it. And, and, the short, and we were only short for the short term. I think your idea of the regional idea of Woody is a great idea. I, I really like that idea that's more regional specific and, and we were driving it more at the institutional level was where our initial ideas were so uh, and the only difference other difference current in my in my letter from our last meeting was where the uh, coordinating board was focusing on at risk and critical fields exclusively and at that my initial reaction was to agree with that. And I still think that needs to be weighted, but it could in create a circumstance where you could have an institution where actually their graduation levels were declining but uh, it, uh, they were still getting awarded because of their critical field and, and, uh, and at-risk performance. So uh, that's where I 
decided that we needed to have the total number of graduates, which I didn't as, run as that well. As well, and then you've even expanded it to add, you know, the graduate students as well, which, I've, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm supportive of that as well. Um, and then the, the, the bigger difference is my focus has been, uh, it is, uh, but more long term, uh, on increased number of graduates rather than total graduates. So to me, that's consistent with being incentive funding at 3.7 percent or 4 percent of the total funding at the margin. <coughs> We're trying to change behavior. Uh, that that seems to be a, a, an appropriate conclusion for, for our mandate. But I know we've got a difference of opinions on that. Okay. Well, yes, Kurt, uh, and, and we we thought about this a lot, and uh, and there are there are argument compelling arguments to be made on both sides of the issue. We ultimately decided to to take a look at total number of graduates because we do have a need in Texas for a certain number of, of engineers and we know what that number is uh, we are for example we set a target in in closing the gaps we needed 6,000 more engineers in a given period of time we fell far short of that so it's it's uh, we, we, we certainly do want to recognize increases but there is a there's a there's a there's an end that we need to achieve, and that's why we decided ultimately to uh, to recommend that uh, instead of funding be awarded on the total number of degrees to encourage large programs to be still more productive, and then the percentage increase in critical fields. And, and, and Raymond, my only response to that would be: it seems to me that's more appropriate for our form, formula funding to be focused on supporting. That outcome, and that at the more, and so we could argue whether we got too much into the incentive funding and not enough in the formula. But at the, at the, once again, the incentive funding should be what you're at the margin trying to incentivize the CEO of that institution to say, "What can I do differently than I've what, than I've been doing that's supported by formula funding? What can I do differently yeah. to increase yes. the no, number of graduates yeah. in total and, and within these particular fields?" And that and that's my only yeah. Comment. No, we we recognize that that's a totally legitimate way of doing this. Uh, the, the next uh, item on the agenda is from Bernie Francis. It does not bear his name, but it's entitled Incentive Funding for Texas Colleges and Universities. I think it's in your agenda packet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, items one and two, we've kind of already fallen out into the air here, but uh, the baseline should be you know, based on the three most recent uh, performance years. Uh, item number two, uh, you know, reward increased numbers of graduates with added weight for at risk and, and those graduating in high need areas. I think we've talked some about that. Uh, the next one is uh, to incent four year and two year graduation rates, which is a priority of the state. That's essentially from a business perspective. My business perspective would be taking the savings from your light bill and your your bricks and mortar savings and giving it back to the folks who made it happen. So uh, that's item number three. Item number four has to do with the, uh, you know, students being um, under the under the duress, I guess you would call it, of, of, of uh, textbook pricing. And we thought that uh, if they would give us uh, uh, two consecutive uh, semesters, Thirty credit hours, uh, we would give them a five hundred dollar textbook bonus. So, um, just a little bit outside the box, creative thinking on that. And then the number five kind of comes from I'm in the IT field myself, and we have something called the program office, and where we try to try to bring together all the best practices and and uh, and use it as a resource. So, uh, I'm simply saying there that you know those. Um, those colleges, universities who are making it happen, where we should have a, a clearinghouse of best practices and we should use, um, offer some uh, incentive funding to uh, those other university colleges and universities if they, if they promise to go ahead and adopt some of the best practices. So that's pretty much it. Comments, thoughts? Uh, just for clarification, your point number one, I presume, would be applicable to just for your 09 and going forward. Yes, yes. Uh, point number two, I presume, would also be applicable to both. Yes, sir. Just for your 09 and going forward. 
the graduation rates. I presume we do have data on that. Oh, yes. So it would be something that could be used for 09 as well as going forward. I recall that Dennis Jones, who was a consultant, not an, not the decider, to use President Bush's term, recommended against graduation rates and in, and recommended graduation graduations rather than a four-year or five-year rate. Is there any thought about that? Once again, we're talking about incentives. Okay, I mean well, graduations, you know, could be handled in the uh, in some other fashion. But we we were we had our 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 incentive funded ha ha incentive funding hats on. We had our business hats on, and 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 we do. There is value to getting kids to graduate in four years and two years. So uh, for that value, we were willing to. Uh, Provide them. I mean, uh, provide the universities uh, some incentive funding. Uh, Diana Natalicio is not here. I've heard her speech for 20 years. Do the community colleges have a comment about that? <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Just my grandfather over there is my uncle. I can give Diane Natalicio's hour of remarks in 30 seconds. <laughs> and it is that those who just cannot, because of their cir life circumstances, graduate in four years and they should not be disincentivized from graduating. Well, and, and again, I, I will make that, that comment. It's, it's a very difficult uh, factor to for us to. Uh, document to look at because the students are in and out of our system all the time. Sure. Um, it sometimes it takes uh, some of our, our our students five years to get an associate's, but that's because they quit for a year, come back after a year, and just they're in and out. Some are in the military, for example, and have to go do service somewhere. So yeah, there is that issue, and then and and that's something that needs to be looked at. I think if we get into a very finite system of, of determining that, then we would really need to look at that. But uh, for the, uh, I've been targeting mainly the the 09 uh, distribution, and uh, I think we've got the data that we could you know uh, live with in, in that sense. But in long term, if we get that specific, yeah, that's going to be an issue to really look at in terms of the populations, the differentiation between populations of the four-year institutions and the community colleges, because it is a very different different uh, community. I'll just I'll just add that uh, there is some momentum. Uh, uh, in the direction of distance-based learning, online uh, online learning, that kind of a thing, which might mitigate. That's helping a lot. Yeah, yeah. For so, example, SAC, one of our colleges, is probably the, one of the largest in the nation in terms of uh, long-distance learning. And it helps, it is helping our completion rates, our graduation rates significantly because of that. Sure. Well, let's, let's keep this on the table, both okay. for 09 and for going forward, and we'll see how the relative weights Sure, yeah. Kurt, a point of clarification, I think this applies to both uh, Bernie and, and uh, Woody's proposals. Do you mean graduation rates for community colleges or do you mean completion rates so that we also include people who complete career and technical education programs but don't actually receive a degree? And in, my, in my case, I only use graduation rates for the capacity building if we needed a formula for 09 and just to be able to award, to use the, uh, you know, in an in inverse relationship. In other words, to lower the graduation rate but indicate a higher need to build your capacity. And that could be if we had to find a formula to do it. That was my only suggestion. I totally agree with Kern that, uh, and that graduation rates are not, I mean, the, the, the particular, I know Raymond, you fully understand the, the, the definition of a graduation rate, and they, when you try to apply it to certain institutions versus others, it, it just doesn't work. No, I, and, I agree. We should look at graduation. And the rates. total number of graduates is the is <laughs> yeah. the, the, the preferred method to, yeah. to, to, yeah. to I, look I at productivity if you want to an institution. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it gets a technical issue that just has to do if you know an incoming freshman. It's got to be continuous there, and they measure them four years later, and that's your graduation rate. Well, most of our institutions in this state. You know, or have got transfer students in or out, whether they're from community colleges, they've got people that drop in and drop out for income purposes. 
graduation rates, when you compare them to another institution that have much higher, higher family income, et cetera, it, it just doesn't work. So um, I only use it in the short cap measure for capacity, uh, and I would not use it, well, at least my recommendation would be, don't use it in, in, in any incentive fund. Now, uh, Bernie, your point number four actually brings up an issue that we have been relatively neglectful of with this committee, and that is the rider and the appropriations bill does provide that there can be scholarship money taken from this hundred million dollars, and we have not really had much discussion about how that scholarship money would be allocated. I think there was some discussion that it might go specifically, and this may even be in the in the rider, to the people admitted to an institution under the 10 percent rule. Uh, whether, or, whether or not that would also, there, there would also be a financial need component of that. I don't know whether we have the authority to recommend uh, whether that would be for students admitted under the 10 percent rule who completed 30 credit hours, I suppose, could be a I, uh, we, we ran some refinement that would be possible. We ran some numbers on, on top 10 percent students and what uh, the, the coordinating board uh, was working on was a need plus merit model. But you, you would have to demonstrate need, but uh, merit would be a component so that we would be able to capture uh, more uh, students from middle class families who, who have incomes above the average for which we typically right. provide funding um, but still demonstrate need. Uh, and if I'm interpreting Bernie's suggestion here, we might or might not add in addition a uh, preferential uh, award to those who completed 30 semester hours that first year. Exactly. That's some comments, thoughts? That again would not no. reward the poor student who has to work, but would certainly incentivize the kid who can take 15 hours a semester to stick it out and do so rather well, than... Now, it's, it, it's important to point out that we do have an incentive financial aid program uh, in exactly that regard, the Beyond Time program. Yeah. It's, it's, it, uh, if uh, students graduate in four years for a four-year program and, had, and achieve a 3.0 GPA, the loan is forgiven. And even if you don't meet that standard, the worst thing that happens is it's a zero interest loan, which isn't bad. So we, we do have an incentive for students to uh, to finish as quickly as possible. We also have an, we just passed a, a board What's incentive. What's that called, the Be On Time program? Be On Time, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. We just, we just passed a board incentive in San Antonio also at the, in the Alamo College District. For for example, if you stay with us for those 30 hours, and it's continuous, you also take a summer semester uh, we will freeze your tuition for that whole time, from this today stay, uh, from the day you're enrolled. So that incentivizes the students to stay in the program, and hopefully they can complete and move on to uh, or transfer to a four-year institution in a timely way. Uh, I know that there's there's always a concern about it takes three years, it takes four years to sometimes move on. Uh, this hopefully will help that 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 decision, especially since uh, we're kind of lessening the economic impact on that student in terms of coming up with the money for each semester. So uh, that 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 structure is a, is a good structure to look at. Okay. Uh, point number five. I does anybody? Else, I have a comment about that. Does anybody else have a comment? About that? <laughs> uh, my my comment is from the perspective of someone who has run an institution for a while, and I. I, I don't know how many people out there in the ether would hear this that I wouldn't, would prefer not to, but I would share the dirty little secret that colleges and universities sometimes commit to do things that they don't actually do. <laughs> so I would be a little reluctant to incentivize a commitment rather than to incentivize the outcome. Exactly, exactly. I got you, I got you. Well, yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, and, uh, that, I, I had something like that. I, I was remiss in not getting this in. I was on vacation and I didn't get my, my uh -huh. input in, but I did give provided that for you. But it, in terms of this, I think this be best practice thing, some I've been pushing since I've been on this task force. Again, the STAR Award that the Coordinating Board gives provides a lot of motivation, uh, brings a lot of morale and pride uh, to the institution. 
Uh, we just uh, announced something in our college system that that it's a program that's not incentivized. Nobody supports it. We did our own uh, uh, initiative. Uh, it, it's again the uh, the connections program that I know our commissioner is very well aware of. And, and just to give you an idea of the the, the result, uh, in the uh, fall of 2007, we had 559 students from San Antonio ISD uh, sign up uh, for uh, our college system. But because we went out and recruited them and worked with them and ensured that they had a, a, a they were already registered before they graduated this year, we had an increase of 700 uh, of 32 uh, percent up to 737. Now that's a best best practice because you had some very you know quantifiable and, data and would have an outcome that mm. would yeah be yeah exactly. and, and and again those are the th the kind of uh, things uh, that are, are are programs that need to be looked at and I agree with Mr. Francis about that. But I also agree that the we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel in all this. The, the commissioner's staff has done a fine job in that awards program, and it is it's got a lot of integrity, and it's got a lot of uh, you've got to prove yourself in order to get to that level. So uh, that is definitely a model we can look at, and something we can use to to provide that 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 boost. Sometimes when you get into education, and you get into an accountability factor, or, or, or you're trying to get money out of the state, you end up getting a very low morale, you know, uh, kind of effect from that. But when you're you're incentivized by giving an award and, say, and someone says this is a best practice in the state of Texas, that makes you try even harder. And also, it provides a a, a, a system to track those practices that other schools that are struggling uh, to to address that they can go to and already find a model that they can use. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a I have edited my. <laughs> My number five to adopt the best practices. <laughs> well, what I, what I would suggest is that for 09, all we could ask them to do is commit, and we wouldn't be able to measure whether they did so or not. But would ask you to sort of develop a proposal for going forward, in which we would actually measure. We, it would be possible to measure whether behavior <laughs> and or an outcome had changed uh, in this regard. So we can bring that up again, perhaps, so we can flesh it out. That's all right. Uh, and uh, we do have a memo that uh, is from uh, Mr. Zarate, uh that was not on the uh, agenda but is now on the agenda. Thank you, sir. Uh, just to summarize, uh, I fully am aware of the, uh, the, the charge of the uh, 09 distribution and then what we're going to recommend to the legislature. A lot of what I've submitted here uh, relates to later, basically. Um, the first item is, of course, just an understanding on my part, and I, if I'm correct, fine. If I'm, I'm not, I need to be uh, educated. And that is that the incentive program should not be part of the base funding at all and in any consideration of any kind. And that uh, we would uh, look at rewarding performance beyond the norm and established performance. The second thing is, I know that we want to be equitable and, and try to, to, to help out as many people as possible with this. But by the very nature of a reward system, for example, uh, in this next year, it's not going to be equitable. And that's why I kind of uh, agree with the, the formulas that have been suggested. And uh, whatever formula comes out, it's great. Because, uh, again, uh, being assured that the community colleges are now part of this, that's, that's already half the battle won as far as I'm concerned. Um, there, is an under there needs to be an understanding that there are some institutions serving more uh, at-risk populations or more critical field areas. And that that's going to create the skew where the inequity might, or the the uh, aura of inequity might might happen. So uh, I'm, I just don't want to get hung up on the fact that some schools are going to get more and others are not going to get more. It all depends on what populations are serving and how, what they're doing to generate those populations to come moving into their institutions. The other thing that I've, I've really uh, looked at and that I think it's very vital. Uh, because of the dearth of state funding, you know, for community colleges or for any institution, and that is, what kind of collaborative efforts are there? If there are some collaborative efforts between, for example, the ISDs, community colleges, and the four-year institutions, then we need to look at incentivizing that kind of process because that is a behavioral change that I think is vital uh, uh, for the, for the state. Because we, we tend to uh, get into silos in terms of education and not bring the whole picture together. I think the governor uh, wanted us to look at a more comprehensive approach to what's happening in the state of Texas. So, um, again, and, and my last sentence on this particular item is uh, uh, kind of affirming Mr. Francis, which is we need to look at 
uh, uh, ways to, to identify those exemplary programs and other things that, that are there, they're collaborative and incentivize them. Uh, the last one, uh, uh, something that, that is in my discussion with one of our businessmen in San Antonio has always hit me and, and, I, and, I, and we need to look at that in terms of the scholarship portion of this and that is community colleges have uh, uh, very low tuition rates. They have low uh, teacher-pupil ratios. Um, there is a lot of support for the, for the students as they go through that, uh, through that system. But when they uh, transfer to a four-year institution, whether it be at Texas State in San Marcos or UT here in Austin, sticker shock hits in. And I, I firmly believe, and I concur with this, this mentor of mine in San Antonio, that it might uh, disincentivize those students to continue if there isn't some kind of financial support to ease that sticker shock as they move into the uh, uh, four-year institution. So that's, that's uh, one of the things that I've added as a number four for us to consider. Not for this first round, but maybe for the second round. Mm. So uh, uh, scholarship programs specifically targeted at uh, those uh, at community risk college uh, finishers who are moving on. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. And that are at risk. I like that. It's I'm working idea. on those models right now. Great. And we have we have the the data to to do that is is readily available. I think. Well, if if you look at our proposals for formula funding, uh, it, there's not a specific incentive for universities to work more closely with community colleges, but since the performance, is, the performance funding is based on graduation rates, it, it's not going to take universities a very long time to figure out that they could dramatically improve graduation outcomes by getting more transfer students. They, get, they invest in two years and get rewarded for Precisely. four years. Yeah. That's exactly right. And uh, the, the issue of the scholarships for the students themselves, and I, I agree with uh, Jeff uh, in some of his presentation. Yeah. While we're changing behavior, we need to change students' behavior as yes, well. Yes, sir. As, uh, <laughs> well, we, we also need to help them. I mean, I, I know that if I'm coming out of a community college and I don't have the money to move into an $8,000 eight a year uh, expense and, and uh, I don't want to take on that debt, uh, I may just decide to stop at an associate's degree and not move on. Go get a job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, you're getting some really good jobs in San Antonio now that pay $28, $30 an hour with just an associate's degree. And some people are pretty happy with that. But what does that do for the state? What does it do for our, our ability to be globally competitive? We've got to ask those questions. Roberto, one, one thing we've also talked about, and it's not on the table we're talking about in financial aid right now, is, is there a way to do a 2 plus 2 to encourage that collaboration whereby you set a needs plus merit-based type parameter and then when that community college student finishes their second year, you guarantee them a Texas grant when they roll into that four-year awesome. university. I, I'm, I, I'm, know hear, I'm hearing general consensus that if we could come up with a, a supplement to the traditional Texas grant and to the be on time that would be specifically targeted for transfers from community college to a four-year institution to give them a scholarship access to a scholarship fund. Our grant, I mean, uh, either way. Uh, so perhaps you could uh, come forward with a specific uh, sort of okay. plan for that. My, I, well, I take it back. I never bet what the legislature would do. <laughs> <laughs> but I would not be amazed if the legislature wouldn't look kindly on such a proposal. In your comments, Roberto, on the under number three on the silos, yeah. I mean, I see that between community colleges, higher education, and, and the independent school districts. To me, that gets back to my earlier comments on, on your re trying to tie economic development and the workforce, business community, the political leadership together is how you get everybody out. And it's not, they're not just the school districts in silos, everybody else is in silos. And how do you get out of silos so you can have an integrated strategy? And, and the strategy may be different from the panhandle than for Houston. Right. Exactly. And one of the, the, the vehicles that, that I'm very excited about uh, is the P16 councils where uh, a, a, the community, the regional communities are, are getting together and determining some issues that, that would uh, promote education in their communities. And, and not only just for the higher education part of it, but from you know, pre-kindergarten on through. Uh, in San Antonio, uh, we are working very hard at, at uh, looking at groups to start looking at the, the curriculum, the, 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 the curriculum between, uh, or, or the transfer between junior high to high school and across the county, uh, also into the community colleges from high school and then into uh, UTSA or any of the universities. 
So it, it, it's a big undertaking, and I think most of the areas probably are underway with the P16 councils. But again, it, you need to keep that effort going. Understand that that might that will pr produce the regional impact that you're looking at because it will be localized. It will be specific to the goals of the, of the community that, that's there. And, and higher education, at least in my view, is particularly in mean, current at the medical school level, you're not just on the supply side, you're, you're on the demand side. I mean, you're creating economic development. You're creating demand uh, for high-paying jobs within your, within your area. And the residents, we can tie that together, and higher education understands that they've got a, a demand side role, um, an economic development role, for their so that there's jobs for their graduates when they leave within their within the region, I think we're better off. Any other comments on this? Current current comment. When sure. um, I don't want to divert too much, but what do you ask when we go back to one of your comments earlier? Um, and this is tongue in cheek at what you're saying. We never know what the legislature could do, but uh, assuming assuming that the legislature does come back and incorporate some form of performance funding in the formula, thinking out longer term which is looking at total degrees with no focus on at-risk or critical fields. You know, when we started thinking about it in that terms, we said, well, you know, we started talking about splitting the money, 40 million and 40 million, and doing the absolute number of at-risk and critical fields. The, the thought process also there was, since we now are only narrowly focusing those total number of degrees, that being those areas that we've identified are high-need areas in the state, um, then I think that gave us another uh, rationale for thinking about should we look at absolute number of increases. And we, we agree percentage, I mean the numeric increase, but just the total number of at-risk and critical fields. The thought being, you're not picking up all degrees. That's being picked up over here, assume, assuming you know, formula funding gets approved. But we still need X number of science degrees and math degrees and at-risk degrees. and so. That was another rationale for why we put a two-component system in as opposed to just going to a numeric increase. Not as a rat justification, but to try to, I think it's, we started where you were originally saying, most of us looking at this were private sector guys that were sitting on the board and we said incentive system is, is incremental production. Right. You know, and that's what you incent is you incent every year incremental growth in your goals. But then we came back and looking at those specialized areas. So, because we think there's a there is a big gap there that we're not filling, and we don't want to for those institutions that may be maxed out at that, we don't want to disincent them not to produce those at-risk and critical field graduates. Uh, I would add to that, since both of my daughters are lawyers, that uh, law businesses uh, do incent added production, i.e., billable hours. Uh, there, however, is a limit, and some people reach the limit to how many days there are in the hour, in the hours there are in a day. Yeah. And the incentive system there that works is billable hours, not the increase in billable hours from one year to the next year. Uh, if you incent billable hours, you're going to increase it if you're below what your capability. So that by looking at total. I would suggest that uh, uh, for 09, we look at what you, the coordinating board, terms performance funding as well as what you, the coordinating board, are categorizing as incentive funding that, for that, going that forward. That makes sense for 09. For 09. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's within our mission. Bobby Ray sends apologies that he's not here. He was going to try to join us on conference call, but has not been able to do so to the best of my knowledge. Bobby Ray, if you are, are there, please say so. And he's not. He did submit uh, a uh, statement uh, which has been added to your uh, packet. And let me just read that for the record. Uh, it's addressed to Wayne Roberts, uh, dated today. Uh, in reviewing the agenda this morning, I concluded that I may have been remiss in not paying a more detailed proposal that had intended to be there, meaning here, to craft an acceptable solution from the discussions. I would ask you that you convey my support of the concepts set forth in Dr. Goldenthal's memo of April 19, 2008, and that refers to those four categorizations. I am committed to keeping the distribution method simple, as I believe we've all tended to agree, and 
Mr. Ray says he rejects the idea of using tiers or quartiles to stratify rewards. That may be worth our coming back and having a general discussion about in just a second. In distributing the immediate fund, I believe we must recognize we are actually rewarding past behavior found to be desirable and commit to using the second portion of our work to develop incentives to encourage future behavior to reflect common desires and goals. Finally, the rewards must be distributed based on performance related to achieving the goals of closing the gaps, specifically those related to participation and success. My suggestions are married in Dr. Wilenthal's suggested methodology, I think, then again referring to the ABCD. As you know, I have requested some clarification to be sure exactly where my opinion can fit within today's debate, but have been informed that it cannot be prepared in time for today's meeting. I support the use of the four factors, A, B, C, and D, and believe I, I lean, this is Mr. Ray, lean toward placing more funds in A and B, which is total number and total annual increase in degrees, and smaller amounts in the bonus categories, which have to do with the uh, at-risk and critical fields and increases in those, but cannot be sure until I know the distributive effect. As such, I have no separate proposal, but feel it would be beneficial for my fellow committee members to know where I stand in general from the outset. And I look forward to participating this afternoon via telephone, and we're sorry that Mr. Ray has so far been unable to do so. Uh, let me suggest that, uh, that we do come back and, and specifically address a point that uh, Mr. Ray has brought up uh, that has been only touched on before, and that is whether or not in looking at increases, whether percent increases or numeric increases, whether we want just a same rate for all of those increases and extra graduate times X dollars or an extra percent times X dollars or whether we want uh, the bottom quartile to have their extra graduates be times one dollar and the second quartile being their number of graduates times two dollars and so forth. And uh, Mr. Ray suggests a constant factor rather than a tiered factor. In, in my letter, I suggest the same, that we have the same rate or the same weighting for, for the same outcome. And, and in my letter, I did as well. Any other comments about that? Can, can I comment on that? I, I, again, in trying to design a true incentive system that incents behaviors and best performance, the thought there was, and I, I can't remember, I don't know if Susan Brown's in, I think our, yes, I think our breaks on those degrees were, were they 8, 4, and 2, or 10, they, they were 10, 5, and 20, 10, 5, and 25 numbers per, per unit, you know, whatever we're measuring, okay? And the thought there was, you know, if you're in that bottom 50, you know, you, you shouldn't get incented as much. You know, if we really want to drive out better performance, better behavior, then I think that's what incentive system does. You, you set a, a higher dollar amount for the top 25%. So now we were sensitive, current exactly. You know, we said, okay, what happens between that that 53 and 48? Do we lose some? And based upon our runs, we did. Now, of course, that can change in any one year. So there's no guarantee, and we understand that. But again, again, that was the thought process. Are we really designing an incentive system? that in sense best behavior, best performance, and and that's where we're trying to get. Is and if, to and if you look at right the runs that which we'll be looking at shortly, that particular if you focus 100 percent right. gives you the greatest dispersion of outcomes um, because of the tiering. Right. The, if you focus on graduates, it's got the next dispersion, and if you fo focus on the total, focus on the increase, it's in between. You focus on the total, it has the lowest right. dispersion. Uh, so. You know, it kind of depends on. <laughs> we can mix those three, or one. We could go with one, or we could mix all three, or we could mix two of the three, as you've suggested so far. But my only point is, is in you've got one that's got a great dispersion, and you're mixing it with one that has the lowest dispersion. Um, and so, is I mean, is there a, a is one balancing the other to a certain degree? Because the more you you put total in, you're you're narrowing the outcomes yeah. to the extent that you discard that and focus on the tearing, you got much wider outcomes. Do you really need, I mean, are we overcomplicating it, I guess what I'm saying, trying to balance the, the two together? 
Because I'd be right in the middle on the total number of graduates. So. My, my worry about that would be that what we do in 09, it's going to be a windfall, whether it's a million dollar windfall or a $10 million dollar windfall, and you want to be certainly not equal. Equitable can be taken two ways. <laughs> yeah, equal, we don't want. Right. Fair, we do want. And I would be worried that a small difference might be unfairly distributed. My other worry, longer term, would be the following. If an institution found itself way down in the bottom quartile or stuck in the second quartile, and to get up to the real performance would require a really major investment, and they look at the reality of their situation and say, you know, I'm just not going to be able to get up there to where it's worthwhile. So I'm going to focus somewhere else. I would not want that bottom quartile to feel like there was not a real meaningful incentive for them to do better, even if it do they don't get to the top quartile. So I think incentivizing the institutions that are not doing pretty well and would take a really heroic effort to get up into the but just a, an improvement still ought to be very much incentivized. And that added graduate in the bottom quartile, whoever that institution may be, is worth just as much to the state as the added graduate in the top quartile. I think so. that's, to me, that'd be the, your last comment would be the one that says equal weighting makes the, it's fair. Uh -huh.